Great. Final paper? Thank you. Also, fun note, Walmart and Cajunville is not open. Yeah, just like there were, yeah, I think they have the CG tool that was mentioned, the presentation that was mentioned in the QA. I do credit for that, though. Okay. You mentioned that if it was uh, answered after. Uh, just to review for Eric, and you know the, the uh, format because I believe you practiced. Uh, at, so you have between 10 and 12 minutes. At 10 minutes, uh, Fabio will be timing. She'll hold up the two minute warning, 11 minutes to one minute warning, and then you will have to stop at 12 minutes and finish the sentence you're on, but we won't start timing until you do your thank yous. So, how are you feeling? You feeling ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, are we ready for, for our next presenter? Uh, Eric Scharfenberg, Advancing Theatrical Design Through Engineering. Hello everyone, and welcome to my, uh, my presentation on Advancing Theatrical Design Through Engineering. I'm Eric Scharfenberg, and I'd like to thank my advisors, uh, Stephen McAlpine and Jill Wrigley, as well as my faculty mentors, uh, Dr. Rothman and uh, uh, Christian Bell. Uh, and my interdisciplinary studies uh, degree title is Entertainment Engineering. So, um, how many of you have gone to a theatrical production and seen something where you just don't know quite how it works? Well, that's, that's what I do. Uh, as a job, and uh, I've, I've been doing it here at UMBC for the past four years. And uh, one of the problems that I came across, uh, you know, trying to get something to work um, in a very unique way was uh, rigging in the black box theater. Now, um, the black box theater, uh, here's a picture of UMBC's black box theater, and it's essentially a room with four walls. It has modular seating so it can be reconfigured, and uh, it has a lighting grid so lights can be hung in any orientation. This allows for a lot of versatility in the space. Uh, and theatrical rigging is moving scenic elements uh, through the use of pulleys and, and wire rope um, in order to uh, achieve a specific design goal. Now, uh, rigging has been done in this space before. Um, however, there are a few problems with it. Uh, so. The materials that uh, were used weren't rated materials, so they didn't have a safe working load uh, limit. And uh, this wasn't a major problem because the, the loads were uh, very light, but um, if heavier loads were used, then uh, a problem would be encountered with that solution. Um, an another problem is that uh, these solutions were built specifically for one show, and they couldn't be reconfigured to any other shows and uh, they just had to be taken down completely afterwards. Um, and in researching this topic, I found no, uh, no solutions in the industry that, that would work uh, with the type of black box here at UMBC. Uh, and really little is, uh, is even done uh, rigging in black boxes uh, across the map. Now, in order to uh, understand this problem better, I looked at it uh, through uh, the lens of three different disciplines. Uh, first, theater as a business, and then scenic design, and then engineering. Um, so uh, here's my concept map, and, um, and it shows the uh, three main disciplines and uh, the, the checks and balances that each one has, and how they, how they check and balance against uh, one another. Uh, so, for example, uh, as a business, the theater needs to reduce costs of, costs of uh, future um, future productions, and um, um, also maintain the safety of the space. So, um, uh, also in scenic design, um, different different changes are needed. Uh, it might be a wall uh, uh, tilting downward, or just a, a light or a microphone <coughs> flying up and down. Um, and the location of those objects always change with each design. And engineering really ties uh, those two disciplines together, uh, providing the tools necessary to um, correctly solve the, the problem. Uh, here's a larger view of my concept map. Uh, here's a picture of a basic uh, rigging system. So, uh, 
the operator would be located on the catwalk here, and this is the, the lighting grid, and this is the object that they'd be flying. So by pulling on this rope that goes through these two pulleys, uh, the operator can raise and lower uh, a scenic element. Uh, so the three uh, main design goals that I had were safety, cost, and versatility. Uh, safety, very obvious. Uh, the, the theater space is built safe and uh, you don't want to add anything in that would uh, uh, endanger the audience or the uh, or any of the cast or crew. Um, now, cost uh, uh, cost goes along with safety. You can usually buy uh, uh, safer materials uh, uh, materials that can have a higher uh, load rating on them, but they're usually more expensive. And uh, versatility um, the the rigging system needs to be able to move to any point on this grid, uh, or, or almost any point, um, uh, in order to accommodate uh, future scenic designs, which uh, which are unknown until until they they're designed. Um, now there are some limitations. Um, there are permanent fixtures on the black box grid, um, which uh, I've highlighted here in red, and then. Um, some some features uh, like air ducts that I've highlighted in yellow that are that are possible uh, conflicts with rigging. So the red areas are places where um, where rigging is unavailable. But uh, to reach these center spots, you could uh, put a a piece diagonal and uh, and uh, attach a, a pulley in the middle of that section. And uh, um, in a in a future slide, you can see that better. So, um, the first uh, part of my design was selecting the right materials. Now, as I mentioned before, safety and cost uh, uh, go together, and um, the higher the cost, the, the safer it is generally. Um, and uh, I wanted to use the standard uh, theatrical construction materials, things that are used at UMBC scene shop that are kept in stock. Uh, that would also reduce cost and uh, um, also allow, allow the parts to be reconfigured uh, very easily. And um, any new hardware that, purchased, that, that would need to be purchased uh, uh, needs to be inexpensive. Uh, here's a data sheet for a part. These are, um, this part is these two clamps you see there, and uh, it's for this material called strut channel. And um, uh, the strut channel is a modular, a, a modular uh, building material and uh, has a very strong uh, 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 rating for, for load. Now, uh, these clamps, uh, which would uh, hold this to the I-beams that are uh, located in the grid, um, uh, here, here are the ratings for them and uh, even in the weakest direction, uh, it can still handle 500 pounds. So, <coughs> That uh, that's a pretty uh, strong uh, material, and uh, they only cost about ten dollars a pair. So uh, it's still it's still inexpensive. Now, in order to provide the versatility that I was aiming for with this uh, system, uh, different modules needed to be created. Now. Um, uh, to mount the uh, the pulleys to the I beams. Um, there, uh, there are two different types of, uh, of I-beam mounts, and uh, they, they look like this, and they're just two different lengths for the two different sizes of I-beams that are in the black box grid. And then uh, three different configurations for the, the ship blocks that you see here. Those are just uh, uh, pulleys um, that are mounted. And um, the, uh, the materials used in this are, um, are very standard, and uh, this could be installed with just a, a C wrench. Now, to make sure everything is uh, um, safe and uh, going along with the uh, load ratings, um, I need to determine the safe working load. And um, rated hardware helps a lot with that. So, uh, as as you saw on a previous slide, the uh, the clamps themselves could. Uh, could support 500 pounds, and uh, uh, many many materials that I've selected have uh, their own ratings. However, um, 
some materials such as uh, steel angle iron or steel plate uh, don't have uh, ratings and um, I needed to run uh, simulations with them and, and do uh, different calculations to determine the, the safe working load. Um, when I was doing those calculations, uh, I always used the worst case scenario, so uh, basically trying to get the system to break to see uh, how strong it needs to be in order to uh, never break. And uh, also I applied factors of safety, uh, and that, that just uh, means that uh, it's, a, it's a factor applied to the uh, maximum load that um, uh, for example, if you know that it can handle 500 pounds and you apply a factor of safety of 5, uh, that gives a safe working load of 100 pounds, you know it will never reach uh, close to that 500 pounds that it would fail at. Uh, in conclusion, my design is safe, versatile, it's low cost, um, it has a low installation time, and uh, it's easily adjustable. Uh, here you can see one of the, uh, the drafts. Um, this would be used for construction of the, uh, the module. And um, this is just uh, one, of, uh, one of five different drafts. Um, any questions? Questions? Mm -hmm. I have quite a few. Can we revisit your concept map? That's a large version, yes. Um, okay. Um, so when you were explaining this concept map, it wasn't clear to me where each of the different disciplines are kind of making each other accountable uh, based on your concept or your in, um, interdisciplinary strategy. So you say the needs of theater um, the discipline that that's for is called? Uh, just theater as a business. It's, it's more of a business aspect. Because um, okay. theater is run as a business, so they need to maintain the safety of the space as well as yeah. uh, keep costs low. Okay. And scenic design, that's just theater design? Uh, that, that is the design of, uh, of sets, yes. And, uh, so that's more artistic in so, nature. And so, given I understand that, what are the perspectives that you're drawing from each discipline? Each other time. I just want to make sure I, I grade you properly on this part. Um, well, uh, I mean, it's just uh, each each uh, um, discipline has its own unique uh, needs that uh, need to be accounted for, and um, and those are shown as uh, you know just branching out from the discipline itself, and then those uh, relate to other needs that uh, other disciplines have. Uh, with these yellow arrows that um, that show the uh, connections. And did you fill in those boxes based on um, from from your research? Or are these yeah yes recognized uh, by professionals as actual limitations from each discipline? Um, I mean, yes, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Well, uh, yes. Yeah, so Following on that, so did you also, did you study uh, what other riggers are doing? So like when we talk about experts in each discipline, so uh, did, did you read up on engineering for the theater or were there particular set designers uh, that you were looking at? Like talk to us a little bit about um, what you studied to be able to do uh, this map and and your synthesis and your new design, mm -hmm. which was pretty cool. Well, but uh, uh, did you do? Did you read some literature? What was the research piece of this? Uh, so um, a lot of it does come from personal experience and uh, and you know using my my skills through engineering to facilitate designs in uh, at the UMBC theater. But also uh, there's companies like. Uh, um, uh, I can't I can't think of them now, but uh, I believe it's uh, Clancy um, Clancy Rigging. Uh, it's a theatrical rigging company, and uh, um, and I, I looked at what they're currently using, um, as well as uh, uh, they actually had a neat article that showed their the the history of their company uh, 
from the um, late 1800s to modern day and, and how it's changed. Um, and uh, as far as scenic designs go, it's very difficult to find scenic designs because they are the property of those artists and they aren't often just, you know, they, they don't share all their drafts or anything. And, uh, and uh, most shows that, that are put on, um, uh, because again, this is copywritten, the plays are copywritten, the designs are copywritten, uh, they're the intellectual property of those people. You're not allowed to take pictures, you're not allowed to, uh, you know, really document stuff you know, from, from that aspect. So you couldn't find, you couldn't find like peer-reviewed articles on set design? Uh, I mean, on, on the theory of set design, yes, but, but rigging in, in scenic design is, uh, it's it's more of it's a very interesting ground because it, it kind of leaves the set designer and goes to the technical director as their responsibility to figure out how to make it work. Um, and I I also did look through. I hear your distinction. Yeah. There's one thing about the aesthetics of we're going to make it look like a backdrop, mm -hmm. and there's there's the rigging to make sure it doesn't fall down. Mm -hmm. That's the distinction. Yeah, you're and making. that's that's more of the engineer. <laughs> okay. when that crosses back over into the engineer, which I see as the technical directors do. So can you go back a few slides, and I just want to make sure I didn't miss this. But did you pose the actual research question? Because you mentioned that there was a research question, but I didn't see uh, it. You know. uh, no, I, I, uh, I don't have it written here, but uh, my research question is uh, um, how can uh, black box, uh, how can rigging be facilitated in UMBC's black box uh, while maintaining the safety of the space and... Okay. Uh, and did you formulate a hypothesis in your conclusion? How did you address the hypothesis from the research question? Um, Not sure how to answer that. Sorry. Um, so I know you created a new design, mm -hmm. and which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to make sure that the design addressed the research question, um, or did it not address the research question? So that it just it's just it's a cool project. Just mm -hmm. finding hard how to, to well, create it. Yeah. You know. uh, I. I did create. Uh, I did design a a rigging system that fulfilled the needs of my research question. So, let's say maybe another another way to answer ask the question yeah. is. Um, so you showed. I think your next slide showed the current, the one that shows the rigging and where you have. The, so this one, and I think maybe this is really the question, right? Is that in a space that looks like that, right? How do you design a system that provides all of the versatility that the scenic designers are looking for, but still do it within reasonable cost and do it safely, right? So I'm looking at that and it's like, okay, there's no place to put anything, right? So, so I think maybe that's really the question. So if you could talk a little bit about how you thought about the design process from the engineering perspective, but then, right, how that then ties back to what is it that the scenic designers want to do and how does your design actually address that? Okay, well, um, my design um, <coughs> allows for uh, pulleys to be located um, anywhere uh, that it's, uh, uh, anywhere on this, uh, this draft except where it's read. And uh, it, it does that by uh, attaching um, a piece of uh, steel box tube to two to two points that can be positioned anywhere on uh, any of these I beams. Uh, so you could have one there, one there, and then have a diagonal, and that would, you know, you could uh, get a pulley in the middle of this space without uh, without interfering with any of these permanent structures. So. Um, and by allowing the points to be located anywhere, that uh, that would allow for you know a, a scenic designer to say, I want you know a lace there or a wall to to go there uh, that flies. And, uh, 
question. If I could just sort of almost return to the first question, but blend it with what you've just been telling us. Where would you as a professional want to tell the world about your clever designs so that, it, so that other people weren't inventing the same wheel in another black box theatre in LA right now? Um, Is there a trade I, journal or anything like that? I, I'm not really sure where to, or where Uh, because I, I myself couldn't find anything yeah. like, like closely after, related right. to this, so uh, I don't know, you know, where... Sure, yeah. one last thing. In your, in your personal experience of doing this with mm -hmm. theaters, where do the technical directors meet the scenic designers for their discussion? Is it on a production-by-production -production basis? Or yes. Or is there anywhere where communities get together and swap good ideas? Uh, it's really... The technical part and the artistic part are actually... Uh, pretty separate, um, so there is kind of a divide there. Uh, there is, uh, uh, there are different theater conferences such as USITT where, that, but that's purely uh, technical, uh, and, and that, that would actually be a good place to, you know, um, to, to show, yeah, to show okay. this as um, a design, but, um, but that, that also doesn't, that's for technical theater specifically, not the scenic designers or the uh, you know production managers that work as the uh, you know in theater as a business. So, I promise to be the very last one. I'm thinking, <laughs> but just sort of following that theme through. So, in your experience, is it the case that the artistic director will have a vision and they will then hand it over to the technical people and say, make it work? And then the technical people will at some point come back to them and say we can't. I mean, how's that? How's yeah, that to and fro work? That's that's pretty much it. Uh, I mean, okay, it's, okay. Uh, <laughs> the the scenic designer comes with a design, and uh, the technical director budgets it and says if it's viable or not. And okay. yeah, uh, but it is production by production. I'm just holding back Marcus, but thank you. That uh, helped me. Well, I actually sure. wanted to continue on that train as well. Um, so I'm sure you conduct you conducted the literature search mm -hmm. on this topic, and I wanted to know, did you gain any new insights from what other experts in the field were doing in particular to problems like this, and how did they drive their new designs? Uh, well, again, it was very difficult to find a problem like this, okay. uh, and what I really drew from was the uh, the rigging solutions that are used in, other in the more standard proscenium mm -hmm. uh, style theaters. Uh, as well as what I've done that's worked in the past, I'm modifying that to be uh, to be rated uh, essentially, so that uh, you know uh, you can be confident that it won't fail. Okay. And you, do you think there are people out there who can see your research and be inspired to implement it into their theaters? Uh, yes, but uh, this is also a design specifically for UMBC's yeah. black box, yeah. so. I mean, the, the black box has to have an I-beam grid located above it, which not, uh, uh, I mean, this is the only black box I've been to that actually has that, so um, it is a specific design, but uh, I feel like, I feel like the, the concept of it and certain parts of it uh, that other theaters could definitely uh, take things away and use it to create their own solution. What's almost four o'clock? Do you have questions? questions? Yeah, I just want just one more. Um, did you go to your finite element result? So, uh, yeah. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about um, when you said you did worst case scenarios. So how did you think about that, and what actually did you decide was your worst case? You know, from a boundary um, conditions and loading perspective. So um, my worst case scenario was uh, the the I beam grid is uh, essentially squares, uh, and so. Uh, to uh, I my worst case scenario was the um, the beam that was supporting the pulley would go from one corner to the the other, making it the longest unsupported run in the middle, uh, and the pulley would be located exactly in the middle, uh, perpendicular to the beam to create the most uh, uh, twisting um, in it, and uh, because one, uh, one by two box tubing that's the that's the weakest direction for it. Um, okay, so box beam this way, load this way, or load? Yeah, um, well, well the, the load of a pulley, uh, 
uh, in this position is always going to be uh, one going straight down and one going, uh, one going straight, across. straight across, so the resulting okay. force would be ah, okay. 45 degrees. Nice. Gotcha. Okay. Hmm. Good. What was the load capacity for the actual pulleys? Um, well, <laughs> the pulleys that UMDC has, about $20 a piece, they're used in uh, the aircraft industry, so 1,200 pounds each. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the system actually, it, uh, um, with, with just one by two box tubing being uh, the material that, um, that would span the I-beams um, and the pulley would be connected to, uh, the safe working load I came up with was only uh, 33 pounds. So uh, that, uh, I, I mean, most, most of the rigging, uh, that's perfectly acceptable for it. Um, and, a, a person themselves can't lift much more than that, anyways. Um, but you yeah, thirty-three pounds. Yes. So what do you? What are? What do those actually look like typically? What is that like? A wood frame with cloth over it, or well, that uh, no, no, that that is uh, for for the the pulley in the worst case scenario um, uh, with the with the uh, one uh, one by two steel mm -hmm. box tube. Yeah, but what do you? But suppose you have a piece of scenery, right, that you're moving. Oh. Right? What, what would that? What would that actually look like? I think Andrew's question is, okay, it's only 33 pounds. What are you actually going to make? That's mm -hmm. only 33 pounds. Well, uh, it could be. Uh, it could actually be used in conjunction with multiple ones because each one can handle 33. So if you had a heavy object, uh, you most likely wouldn't have it with just one point. You'd have you'd have multiple points uh, splitting the load up between it. Um, I mean, it. A, a single one can carry anything that's 33 pounds. You know, there's there's no there's no right answer for that because it's up to the scenic designers to decide what they want to move. But so, I, so out of your experience, so describe so for something that you've done in a previous production, the black box theater. Yeah. You know, give an example of something that you had that you had to that you could see, mm -hmm. right? Well, for example, a chandelier. Uh, a chandelier is a very easy example, and uh, that that could be. Uh, raise the load, um, and that's something that a, a single person could operate and you wouldn't need a motor for. Yeah, um, so for black boxes, things like, sh I guess we think of scenery, right, as these big giant walls that move up and down. Is that typical in a black box? Or would uh, you no, that would be more a proscenium style because you have the counterweight rigging, which allows for heavier loads. <coughs> but, um, in a black box, I've, I've heard of some very interesting designs with furniture. Uh, going up and down where, where there's nothing on the floor and then the furniture would all come down from the ceiling. So, <laughs> so it's sort of like little bits and pieces here and there rather than big giant walls. Mm -hmm. That's a try you have you know visualization of what's actually moving around. Mm -hmm. okay. Or and it can also be used in different configurations. For, for example, there could be a wall that um, needed to pivot down and uh, uh, that that's a lot less than lifting the entire wall. So uh, you should be able to handle something like that as well. I think that was a, a misconception I had throughout this. I was I was thinking proscenium theater when you were really talking about black box, which is a small. <coughs> you know. are, are there uh, studies of you know great failures in theater rigging? I'm thinking there was the Spider Man. <laughs> yeah. uh, do do riggers talk about you know great? Oh, don't do what that guy did on Broadway when the guy fell from the ceiling. I mean, are, are there uh, studies of, of rigging failures? I would think that would actually be helpful for riggers. Um, I, I mean, yes, there is. That, and there's entire books written on it, just um, on, it, it's really just oversights in the design where, you know, a, a, a bolt wasn't rated to the right amount, and that one bolt failed, and the entire system fell down. I mean, there's... There's lots of accidents, and there's also human error uh, involved in it. I've I've heard horror stories with automation where somebody just pressed the button at the wrong time, and somebody almost died because of it. So, uh, yeah, but um, there definitely are. Um, okay. Good. Uh, unless there are any questions, we should we should wrap up. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. And there we go.